Hey guys, uh, you know, since I put out my video as to why I left Trinidad and Tobago, I've got a lot of questions asking of me about the state of Venezuela in, in this month, presently May 2017, and uh, if I think it's the potential for Trinidad and Tobago to go down that road uh, that has led Venezuela to the problems that they have now. Now, I'm going to be discussing basically four major economic factors that I think led to the destruction of uh, the private market and the free market in Venezuela that has subsequently caused a lot of these shortages and other problems. Now, full disclosure, I do have family in Venezuela, so I've been hearing a lot of these stories for years uh, from the time of Hugo Chavez and uh, go forward. Uh, so this is, not, this is not something that has happened suddenly. These have been long steps that have taken a number of years uh, and we're seeing the culmination of these things uh, only more recently. Now, contrary to what the mainstream media and, and frankly a lot of propaganda outlets might have you believe, the problems in Venezuela are not pegged simply to the fact that there are low oil prices uh, you know, currently in the market. Uh, all of the oil producing countries have suffered because of low oil prices, including you know, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Trinidad and Tobago, and even the UK where I presently am. But we don't see the systemic problems and shortages and brownouts and these other things that we see happening in Venezuela. So while the problem is not simply the oil prices, there are other factors at play that have caused a lot of these problems. The first issue is the destruction of private property rights in uh, Venezuela. Now, I used to hear from my family that, you know, Hugo Chavez would come onto the television and he would, you know, ramble on for a couple hours. And he basically encouraged the poor and the disenfranchised to move in and, and, and repossess housing from people who owned one or more properties. Uh, now, this resulted in, you know, families who had city, you know, apartments in the cities who might also have beachfront properties or maybe luxury condos. Uh, these people were never compensated. They lost their properties uh, and much of this was handed over to the very poor that, you know, unfortunately, a lot of these places became slums. Uh, so, I mean, that's the destruction of wealth, destruction of value. And a lot of people, you know, lost a lot of value and a lot of worth, uh, you know, from these government policies. Now, it wasn't limited to real estate. As we know, um, the national government eventually seized uh, oil rigging platforms and uh, drilling material from U.S. oil producers uh, more recently, there was a seizure of the GM manufacturing plant uh, for their automobile industry, as well as more recently than that, I think in, in well, in Christmas of last year, a, a bunch of toys that came into the country, uh, a lot of that was seized as well by the state. So the destruction of property rights put a great disincentive on companies to show themselves as being very successful, uh, simply a fear that if they show too much profit or too much uh, efficiency in whatever they're doing, the threat of the state coming in and seizing your business, your your plant, your your job, your bit, whatever it is, um, that was always a looming reality. So that was one of the first factors where these problems became self-evident. The second factor, of course, was the artificial currency controls that the state implemented uh, in relation to the exchange rate to the U.S. dollar. Um, I, I mean, there, there are varying numbers. They say as much as five, maybe six exchange rates exist in the country. Uh, I know that there are at least two, possibly three or four, if you include uh, some of the black market trading uh, in US dollars. So the first one was pegged very low at basically uh, 10 bolivars to one US dollar. That was reserved for the state and state approved enterprises, uh, special importers that were bringing in raw materials or parts or any of these other things. Uh, the second rate was kind of offered to the public. You know, it, it varies. Uh, some last I checked, it was probably about seven hundred bolivars to one U.S. dollar, uh, and then you know there are a couple in between as well as the black market rate, which at this point is skyrocketed up to I think nearly five thousand bolivars to one U.S. dollar. Um, so again, if I have, if I was an importer and I have access to cheap U.S. currency at uh, ten bolivars to one. But at the same time, I could spin around and sell those same U.S. dollars on the black market for 5,000 bolivars for one. There is a disincentive for me to actually go through the trouble of finding a supplier and importing raw materials and dealing with all the logistics, the bureaucracy, the insurance and the cost of transportation, 
plus the host of other bureau bureaucratic things that you have to hurdle through when I could simply just deal in foreign currency and, you know, just get the spread between the two. Um, so a lot of the importing businesses that actually got access to these rates, they just ceased operating. Uh, you know, couple that with the constant threat that if they were too efficient and showed too much profit and they had a lot of assets in their supply chain, the threat that the state might step in and, and basically seize your enterprise was always a looming reality. Uh, so these factors, you know, shut down a lot of the importers. Uh, they couldn't get a lot of the raw material in for manufacturing and these other things. Uh, so that, of course, have led to a lot of shortages that we saw. The third factor is the artificial price controls uh, that have been placed on a number of the staple products in the country. So again, if I was a manufacturer and I just happened to find raw material to produce whatever my good was, you know, I've got the cost of salary and machinery, and electricity, and all these other facets. Um, I have a minimum price, so what's known as the break-even price, of which I can sell my product just to maintain the business as, as it's operating currently. But when the state steps in and they set the artificial price of my good below the break-even price, I've suddenly been priced out of the market. Then I have to consider cutting prices, find cheaper suppliers, uh, you know, or jump through all kinds of hurdles to try and bring my break-even price uh, down to at least match the government controls. Now, of course, with all the other hurdles and all the other problems that the manufacturing and, you know, the, the private enterprises are dealing with, Many of them were simply priced out of the market and it was just too much trouble uh, to try and find suppliers as well as you know, meet a break-even price at these artificially low levels. So uh, those controls decimated the private industry in Venezuela as well. And the fourth major factor is that when oil prices reduced and uh, there was shortfalls in the budget, the government resorted to the printing of money to try to offset uh, the fall of revenue and uh, economics 101 will tell you as the money supply increases there is downward pressure on value and that's exactly what happened the Bolivar uh, devalued tremendously and they're presently in a cycle of hyperinflation uh, and that results in prices rising as the, the value of the currency continues to decrease and you factor in all of those things with everything I've discussed before and you can see why private enterprise, grocery stores, and all these other people, there is just too much or it's near impossible for any business to operate under those conditions. And it's, it's basically led to the shortages and the food crisis and all these other things that are taking place in the country. So again, guys, those are the four major policies that uh, have led to the decimation of the private enterprise in uh, Venezuela that has led to a lot of these shortages. Now, I'm not getting into the politics that they had and the mismanagement of their oil assets, uh, their dealings with the Petro-Caribe deals, not to mention what they owe China. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to get into those things. But in terms of the economics of their free market and why they have the shortages they have, I believe these are the major factors. That's my insight, guys. If you think I left anything out, please you know leave a comment below. Uh, be sure to like, share, and subscribe if you'd like to see more. Thanks again for watching, guys. All the best to you. Take care.